lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. These 24 thrones with the 24 elders before the throne. We have to look where else does this number 24 occur, a double multiple of 12. Some of my pre-tribulational brethren, some of my pre-trib friends, not my own personal view, have tried to contend without any scriptural basis or any text to support it, without interpreting scripture in light of scripture or anything in the exegetical content of the passage itself, have tried to assert that it's the church, that the 24 elders represent the church with absolutely no basis whatsoever for doing so. They just decide it's the church. The question is, where else can you get this number? There's only one place in scripture of which I am aware, and I've looked at this carefully. Jesus told the apostles that they will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 apostles correspond to the 12 tribes of Israel from the prophecy of Jacob in Genesis 49. What the 12 sons of Jacob were, as the patriarchs of the 12 tribes, that is the 12 Sarim or princes, the apostles of the New Testament equivalent. Now understand this. Because of the second golden calf sin that took place under Jeroboam, one tribe was deleted and had to be somehow replaced. Hence, what would have been the tribe of Joseph was split into the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim, so you'd still have 12. This is important when we get to Revelation 7 and Revelation 14. Dan is not there. Because the tribe of Dan was where the second golden calf was worshipped. At Tel Dan, you can still visit the place and the site of the altar. I've been there many times. I believe we have a teaching on location of me doing it there. We are at Tel Dan. Tel Dan was quite ancient. It was a Canaanite site. It was here that Abraham subdued five kings. It goes back to the patriarchal period before the conquest, before Joshua entered the land as a nation. The area was attacked by Joshua, but it was also the area where Jeroboam most famously set up his altar. We'll come to that in a moment. This was the northernmost extremity of what, Abraham's, uh, what uh, Abraham saw when God showed him the land. This was the northernmost, I'm sorry, of what Moses saw. From Mount Nebo, uh, this was the northernmost extremity of what God showed to Moses. It features repeatedly in the prophets, especially Jeremiah, but not only Jeremiah, and is also very, very important in the book of Judges. There was an important battle here, and it, and it marked the northernmost part of the conquest of King Asa, when King Asa tried to bring repentance to Israel and bring the revival that was happening in Judah underway up north. This was the far as he reached. Uh, it escaped the reforms of King Jehu. King Jehu was the only king of Israel who tried to bring repentance to the north. And this place was so far gone that it escaped his attempts to bring judgment on the idolaters. The tribe of Dan was deleted from the 12 tribes you see in the book of Revelation. Three passages go together, Genesis 49, Revelation 7, and Revelation 14. The tribe of Dan is deleted. Okay, the tribe of Dan is deleted. The tribe of Joseph is, of course, split into two of his sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, to make way for Dan. Dan was deleted because of their sin, and the sin that took place culminated and climaxed where we are standing. The golden calf was an emblem of all that should have been abhorrent to an observant Hebrew. It would have been associated with the gods of Egypt. They made a golden calf in the Sinai, and that was the great rebellion in the Sinai when so many fell under God's judgment. 
of all things to build a golden calf. They set up two, one at Bethel, the other one here, from the northern extremity to the southern extremity. And it became almost a colloquialism or an idiom. From Dan to Bethel meant the entire realm of the northern kingdom. After Solomon's sin, you had this schism. Rehoboam and Jeroboam, there were two Jeroboams, and one was worse than the other. Let's look at Judges, perhaps, sorry, 1 Kings chapter 12, please. In verse 27, Jeroboam is speaking, and he says, The kingdom will return to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices... In the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will return to their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king consulted and made two golden calves. And he said to them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, that brought you up from the land of Egypt. They replayed the rebellion that happened under Aaron in the Sinai. And he sent one in Bethel, and the other he put here at Dan, at this very spot, this is the altar. This steel structure is obviously built to replicate the horns of the altar and show you where it was. And he made houses on high places, and he made priests from among all the people who were not of the sons of Levi. He ordained a false clergy. And Jeroboam instituted a feast in the eighth month of the fifteenth day of the month like the feast which is in Judah. And he went up to the altar, thus he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves which he had made. He stationed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. Then he went up to the altar which he made in Bethel on the fifteenth day in the eighth month, in which he devised in his own heart, he instituted a feast for the sons of Israel, and he went up to the altar to burn incense. So he worshipped at the golden calf above Jerusalem. The reason he would have worshipped at that one instead of this one was simple. Most of the ten tribes lived north of Bethel, and they were used to going south towards Jerusalem. But by having one at Bethel, you don't have to go all the way. Just go 85% of the way. We have one here. The other one, what actually was probably the main one, was built here at Tel Dan. Now, we know this famous story that takes place. God begins sending prophets. And we see there was a true prophet who God sent. And the story takes place that the true prophet listened to a false one and wound up in the same grave with him. Those who follow false prophets wind up with the same judgment as false prophets. This place could have been destroyed by King Jehu. But Jehu had the same motivation as Jeroboam. What was that motivation? He was keen to keep control of the throne for himself. He did not want the people to return to the house of David. Therefore, he left idolatry in place. What happened here represents failed revival. It's what happens when you go back this far, no further. We'll get rid of that, we'll get rid of that, we'll get rid of that, we'll get rid of that. But if we touch that, it'll affect us. Now, this kind of compromise is a certain death sentence for any revival. The one man who tried to bring revival to the north was Jehu. Every other king of Israel was backslidden completely. He was the one guy. He got rid of all the high places, all the idolatry, all the priests of Baal all the sons of Ahab. And then he turned against the princes of Judah who compromised with the house of Ahab. He came up, he came up, he came up, he purged everything. But he wouldn't come here. If that goes, I'll lose power. I'll lose position. This same kind of error has been replayed very often throughout church history. What would happen if Nicky Gumbel was to say, we're not going to sprinkle infants anymore. We're going to have believers' baptism. Well, that's what Luther said. No, keep sprinkling the babies. That's what Calvin said, keep sprinkling the babies. 
That's what Zwingli said. Keeps Zwingli, the revival goes this far, no further. When people's personal interests, when their personal power base becomes threatened, they don't want the revival to change everything. They want to bring revival up to a certain point. We'll change certain things. But the reformers were not radical enough. This is an age-old problem. Now those same churches that didn't go far enough are dating homosexuals. <laughs> They're as bad as Rome ever was. This place is a monument to what happens when a revival does not go all the way. It came up north. It came up north, it came up north, till it got here, then it stopped. No, you can't touch that! Yeah, but it's not biblical. Yeah, but don't touch it. Yeah, but, you know, it, 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 God says it's wrong. Don't touch it! What's his motive? This place represents the supreme tragedy in the history of the Northern Kingdom. The one time, the one guy who could have made a difference. He did so much good, so much right, he was relentless. He came quite far, but he didn't come far enough. He didn't come to tell them. This is the gate coming into the city of the Israelite city of Dad, not the Canaanite city of Laish. That's something completely different. City of Laish. That's something completely different. Here you'll see breast stones. The ancient Canaanites who were here a thousand years beforehand did not use the same breast stones as these. They used more of a, uh, uh, a baked brick. Uh, the problem with the baked brick that was made of clay and it could disintegrate at any time or fall apart. But we will see a pretty much preserved Canaanite gatehouse uh, in a little while. All right? Again, remember I mentioned when we were at Medina that we were sitting right here, uh, the gate of the city was the center of life, not the center of the city. The center of the city was the gatehouse. The elders would sit here, sometimes the king would come and hold court. This is where the merchants came in, this is where all the news came in, this is where you made exchanges of, of money, monetary, and until today, like I mentioned earlier, when they ask about the rates of different currency, in Hebrew they would say always, what is the shah, what is the gate price? See, we're in the gate. That's where we are right now. Now also for protective purposes, we've come into a gatehouse and we're turning all the time. And it looks as though that we're gonna keep going uphill, turning and turning and turning. That ought to stop the momentum of an attacking army, right? All right, let's go to war.
<laughs> See, because by the time you're walking up here and turning and running up the hill, you're getting tired. And each time you're making a turn, you're being ambushed by the guards in this gatehouse. This is not just necessarily the gatehouse into the city. The city was up there. You had to go all the way around like this, like a gauntlet, in order to get into the city. So it was done intentionally like this for protective purposes. <laughs> You watched the Olympics this summer in Greece. No. Yep. What happened each time a person received a medal? What did they give them? A wreath. A wreath. What kind of a wreath? Olive. olive wreath. But the olive wreath was never used as the wreath of the victor. So why in the world are they doing that at the Olympics? Why the olive? The olive branch had only one particular reasoning, okay, if you would. This was the symbol for peace, okay? The olive branch, right? Okay. So why in the world did they make wreaths made out of olives? Because there's a lot of olives in Greece. What was always been the wreath of the victor? Laurel. The laurel. These are laurels, guys. This is a laurel. Here they would take a branch like this and twist it into a crown, and this was the wreath for victors, the laurels. Or another word for this is bay leaf. Come on, you're Italian. Put it in spaghetti sauce. Okay, so this is bay leaf, all right? Laurels. These are laurels. This is an olive branch. This is the... Have you ever been to Rome? Yeah. Has anyone ever seen the Arch of Titus? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you notice that besides the riches that the Roman soldiers are carrying on their shoulders of the loot of the temple, and also the Jews who are tied as slaves following behind them, all of the Roman soldiers are wearing the laurels of the victor. It is this plant right here. This is a laurel, all right? This is a olive branch. So why do you think they use that? I don't know. Maybe it was easier for them to find olive branches than for laurel branches. That's the only reason I can think of. Okay? Now, uh, this is also very good for cooking. You know that. Yeah. Now, do any of you ever buy, for instance, like dried, dried goods in bulk? Like, I don't know, bags of rice or beans and all that stuff? Yep. You ever notice sometimes that when you buy these the little uh, weevils inside, yeah. Yeah. little bugs? Well, you, you take some bay leaf. If you have it in a jar or so, you take one or two leaves of bay leaf, you put it on top, and it draws them out, and it kills them. Oh, bay leaf. Okay. Yes, it does. I better remember that. Okay? <laughs>
Yeah, it's a uh, fired play. That's amazing. Far out. Far out. No, no. It's a gate. An entrance gate. Do we go through there or not bother? No, you can't go through. Sorry? Danger, no passage. Oh, okay. Yeah, didn't read the sign. No. The building material you can see is a fire clay, all right? Or a baked clay. Uh, the archaeologists in that particular corner reconstructed some of that clay to give you an idea. But everything that you see just on the other side is all the original. Now, the difference between this and the difference between stone is that this will deteriorate. And the only thing that's kept this gatehouse preserved all these thousands of years is the fact that it was covered up. All right? Because look here, you see where this is a mound of earth? All of this was all chiseled out, and that's what they found there. Now, obviously, somewhere underneath all of this overgrowth here, there's a walled city going back over 4,000 years. Because don't forget, Abraham enters the land approximately 3,800 years ago. Mm -hmm. Right? So this must have existed way before the time of Abraham. So this is the Canaanite city of Laish, as mentioned in scripture. All right? Now you may notice also that the gatehouse is not very big, it's kind of small. Enough for a person to walk in, perhaps maybe walking with a horse or, or a donkey, but obviously not large enough for a camel to go through. But then again, this isn't camel country, is it? Yes. You know, camels you'll find more in a deserty area. Mm -hmm. Here, this will be basically just perhaps maybe a horse or a pack animal. All right? So therefore, the entrance is small, once again, for protective purposes. They weren't as sophisticated or knew about turning the right angles and having the archers from the sides. Mm -hmm. But what they did do something else that's quite unique. Monica, I need your assistance. Thank you very much. Stand right here, face everybody. Very good. I need another volunteer. June. Come to me, please. Now, I want you to turn around, face everybody, but I want you to move up just a little bit. This way. Like that. I need one more. Now you stand like this. Like what? Like that. Exactly like that. This is exactly the gatehouse. In other words, try to take away that scaffolding. The door goes in and parts of the walls protrude outwards. Again, for protective purposes, because once they lock that gate and people are bunching up trying to get in, at least the arches can shoot down from the sides. Correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for the wonderful job. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right? Mm -hmm. So this over here is the uh, Canaanite period gatehouse, mm -hmm. the city of Laish. Okay. So if you want to, you know, we're not going to be in Jericho. We're not going to be anywhere near it. We go around it. But, um, you know, you would be disappointed if you went to Jericho and you saw the walls of the city because they shouldn't be there. Right? They weren't made of stone. Did they fall outwards? No. Did they fall inwards? No. They collapsed. They disintegrated because they were made of the same material as what you see over here. Okay? Because it's the same period of time. All right? Okay. Capture the moment on Kodak. Now, we see there is a close parallelism between the apostles and the 12 patriarchs of the 12 princes of Israel, one for each tribe. Jesus said, you will judge the 12 tribes. Okay. We lost one apostle with Judas Iscariot, replaced by Matthias, and you see the loss of one of the 12 princes. That is one of the 12 tribes to be replaced by another. Same parallelism. This is the only place you get the 24. The 12 apostles and the 12 Sarim, or the 12 princes, that is the sons of Jacob, as the patriarchs of the tribes of Israel. That is the meaning. The Old Testament and the New are represented by the princes of Israel, the sons of Jacob from Genesis 49, and the apostles. This becomes important as we read further in Revelation into chapter 7 and into chapter 14. Nobody, nobody has ever postulated any comprehensive argument for it being anything else. People have arbitrarily decided without any exegetical content or any supporting context that it's the church. But they have no basis, none whatsoever, for doing that. None. It's just a human invention. The only thing we have 
of the 12 tribes of Israel, that is, their patriarchs, the 12 princes, the sons of Jacob, and the 12 apostles. Israel and the church together before the throne as the people of God represented by their patriarchs, by their princes, as it were, based on what Jesus told the apostles concerning the 12 tribes. Moreover, <clears throat> this would directly have impact on what we read about the 144,000 and the 12 tribes in chapters 7 and chapters 14 in Revelation. It's the best explanation there is. I believe it is the correct one. Now, if somebody has another one, show me it, but please be able to support it with some other text. You can't just decide 24 is the number of the church. It is not. Seven is the number of the church. We know from Revelation chapters 2 and 3, 1, 2, and 3. And 12 is the number of God's organization of peoples, tribes, and nations. 12 and its multiples. It is never 24. Uh, representing the church alone. It can only be 24 with the 12 and the 12, the princes and the uh, people of God from the New Testament era together with those of the Old Testament era. This makes sense. Nowhere does 24 on its own ever represent the church. Nowhere. Arguably 12 does, 7 certainly does, but not 24. But if you put 12 and 12 together as multiples, the 12 sons of Jacob and the 12 apostles, based on what Jesus said, the apostles will judge the tribes. It fits. It works. And it fits the text and context of what follows in chapters 7 and chapters 14. Thank you so much for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless.